Have you ever seen one of these boxes mounted in the side of a lamppost and wondered what's actually inside it? Well, the box itself is made of plastic, presumably the glass reinforced plastic that's so common in this sort of scenario. And in this case, it's just got two double insulated cores coming in. One of them goes to a neutral block, one of them goes to a fuse holder, a cartridge fuse holder, and one of them is going to a quartz time, quartz back time clock in here, a Singamo time clock, with what's the most interesting bit of this, it's a solar dial, which means it adjusts for uh, the time of year and uh, changes the sort of duration of the lighting over that period of time. The backing in the box is just, as is often the case, it's just a piece of wood because it makes it, it's the most versatile thing in these because you can just screw as much stuff as you want onto it anywhere. But uh, in this case it's rather crumbly um, chipboard which has perhaps succumbed to moisture over time. Um, and there's been something else in here which I'm guessing from the outline was probably a mercury vapour ballast. Uh, I doubt it would be a metal halide uh, ballast because the metal halide usually requires starter gear as well. So I'm guessing that it was mercury vapour which has a simple starting arrangement inside the lamp itself. But the interesting bit here is this time switch which uh, you take the cover off here and with a bit of force, uh, yeah, quite a bit of force, it pulls out revealing the three pins at the back and the circuit board for the uh, battery backup and the quartz control and then this sort of general assembly for the switching in here. So let's take a look at this on the bench right now. So now we're back at the bench, let's take a look at the individual components. Let's start with the fuse holder. Simple enough. To wire into these type of cartridge fuse holders, you simply insert a screwdriver in one end of the plastic cap and it pops out. It's got this little pin that holds it in place. And once that's out, this extremely rusted screw hole uh, screw can be used to actually grip the cable in place. And likewise, when you're putting it back in, all you do once you've uh, connected it up, you make sure the wire's not sticking too far beyond that, uh, and then you just pop this in and uh, click it back into place. The neutral block here, cut that off. It's just a generic connection block. It's basically a piece of... Uh, I think it's brass, plated brass? I'm not sure. I didn't check that. Uh, the magnet is going to stick to... No, the magnet's not going to stick to anything. That, that's a good start. Yep. I think it's brass. I don't think it's aluminium. Um, and it's just basically, it's designed for connecting large sort of cables. into. It's basically a commoning block for large cables. I would typically call this a Henley block, although I see this one is by... BICC and is UV rated. Made in England. Oh, here's an interesting thing. This is made in England, and this one says made in Scotland. That's refreshing. Sadly, this is all old stuff. And the wires, uh, the thin wire here, the flex cable, that's uh, been what's been feeding the light, uh, probably via the ballast. And it's just basically, they've twisted it round in bulk round the folded over end of this double insulated cable just to fill up the terminal so they get a good connection. Just of interest, let's uh, pop that out completely. They're always a bit squeaky, these blocks. By double insulated, I mean it's got the uh, copper core, it's got a layer of insulation, then it's got an outer layer again, it's just an extra safety feature. So, um, yeah, I think this is just, I think it's brass. Underneath that, uh, one way to find out, let's scratch it. I'm, I'm suddenly feeling all avish by scratching it. Um, yeah, it's brass under there. I think it's brass under there. Tinned brass? Yeah, that looks like brass. Okay. Plated brass. So let's go on to the main portion here, which is the time switch, which is by far the most interesting bit. Because this uh, time switch is a solar dial. And uh, these things, uh, if you ever deal with, come across one of these, there's sometimes a screw in here, this little insert, and uh, to actually get this out, you have to take that screw out. It's a little for locking it in. But after that, it should just pull. And in the base, you've got the three terminals here, which uh, you've got the uh, screws just next to each one. Uh, some of them have a four terminal base, the two for the motor and two for the switch contact. 
But here is the juicy bit. It's electronic, which is quite nice. Uh, the first ones I dealt with were just standard motorised units. Uh, some of them had a spring-loaded backup for a very short period of time. Uh, but these ones, uh, the quartz ones, uh, were much more reliable and could run for a much longer time after the power failed. The downside is that, you know, at this point in time, inevitably it's the nickel cadmium cell that's failed because it's tr being trickle charged all the time. And these, this thing's probably been in for, for years. Goodness knows how, how long this has been in for. I didn't see a date. So uh, this is a solar dial. And what that means is that you can set the time. The, it's got two floating brass sections here. Actually, you know, I'm going to pop this off uh, because it's easier. I'll use a smaller screwdriver for this. Am I still in focus? Uh, am I going to ruin it all now by trying to focus and then it goes completely out of focus? Mm, I think that's okay. Yeah, it looks, looks okay. This is where having a really huge screen would be quite handy. Much as I want to uh, live in the future and be able to record YouTube videos on a mobile phone, it's just sometimes... You know, it, it's not quite there yet, but it's good enough. So this is the solar dial, and you can change the dials. You can put a different dial on. You can just put an ordinary dial, which just has fixed positions around the edge that you can either put. Some of them have drop-in pins. Some of them have the little uh, pins that ride in a guide, and you can just uh, basically loosen that off, slide it round to where you want it, and then uh, lock it. In this case, it's been locked to go off every night at 2400 hours, midnight. Uh, that's because now the man, that is really typical. In, in st whereas in the UK, the lights would probably run, they'd come on the evening and they'd run till the morning. Uh, in the Isle of Man, it's quite common for the lights to go off around about 2400 hours uh, or one o'clock in the morning. And the place is just absolutely pitch black when that happens. But the, this solar dial has these extra little bits at the side. In this case, this one is not being used. This is the one that would normally have been used to turn it off in the morning. And this is the one that turns it on in the first place. And you can see these are flopping about. And the reason for that is that as this turns around, uh, they're pushed back. And there's a mechanism that varies their position around the dial according to the time of year. So right at the moment, uh, it's showing that uh, it's sort of it's gone from December into January. And this is pretty much at the point that the clocks would, uh, well, the clocks would actually be at their longest time. They'd actually be coming on round about, well, let's see, what is it? In the d transition between December and January, the on time can be set between uh, 3 and 5 p.m., 1,500 to 1,700 hours. And the off time can either be fixed by this dial here or you can put it into this and it will go off quite late in the morning. It will go off around about uh, 7.30 to 9.30 a.m., but when this uh, dial is turned round, this increments continually during the year. And at its uh, shortest hours, it's the transition from June to July. And at that point, the dial is in a completely different position. And uh, the on time is about 8 to 10 p.m. And the off time can be set between 2.30 and 4.30 a.m. Because the nights are much shorter. And the mechanism for that involves this little pin here. And as this dial rotates round, this pin wheel here just gets clicked round one slot each time. And that's geared onto this um, worm drive, which is then geared onto this wheel. And it's geared in such a way that uh, basically 365 steps of these represent one year. You can actually see that moving as I click this round because that's ultimately what happens. It just, the cams inside just nudge these backwards and forwards uh, during the year. The pins that stick out the bottom here activate these pins here. One is for on and one is for off. And it literally, it pulls these pins back and then lets them go as it passes. And it's quite an interesting mechanism because it's got a plastic wheel in here that has a cam that pushes the electrical contact up and down. And the middle section of that is the cam that pushes this contact open and close, and the two outer sections are basically um, sort of ratchet effect, pole, pole, pole type things that, as this goes round on one side, it triggers the one side, the ratchet on one side. But that means that if you trigger the on repeatedly, all it will do is it will go on, and that's it. It won't uh, trigger multiple ons. 
it, because in the system where you could uh, insert pins or have multiple uh, sliders around the outside, if you just wanted one on time and one off time, there were sort of captive sliders. You just set two on times immediately after each other, and it didn't really matter. It just ignored the second on time until it came round to an off time, and then that would activate the other side of it. You can also bypass it by clicking this button at the side. That equates to this red button in the case, which uh, just actuates this plunger inside. And when that happens, there's a little ratchet down here that increments it round that plastic wheel round one step at a time. And the contacts are quite beefy. Uh, they're these ones here, and you can actually see the contact through this little window. And you can also see the sooty skid mark because it's obviously been switching a modest load. And it doesn't open a huge distance, but it's just enough to see that it is open. The pins in the back are interesting in their own right. These are solid brass pins, no cheaping out. This is an original, proper, well-designed unit. Uh, any date here? Oh, date of manufacture, 26th week of 1999. Schlumberger, Port Glasgow Industrial Estate, Port Glasgow, PA14, 5XG. Ah, and it's got a modest, it's got a modern number. Um, I wonder if they're still about. It's rated 20 amps, 230 volts, 50, 60 hertz. 50, 60 hertz. Of course, ultimately it doesn't matter with this one because uh, it doesn't have to worry about the frequency because it's got a quartz reference. Now, these big chunky brass pins that I was talking about earlier, they're cross-cut, so that there's a bit of spring in them so that they can fit in tightly. But also, down the middle, there's a little rubber cross that keeps them sprung out uh, slightly. So as you push them in, it really does make a really tight connection, as you saw me trying to pull it out earlier. It was really tight. Taking a look at the circuit board, I, I have to confess this time, I've already had this circuit board out. I wanted to see the circuitry on it. I also wanted to see if I could reincarnate it. Sadly not. The nickel uh, cadmium cell is well gone. I can prove that. I can uh, power that up right now. Hold on. Let's just smack the positive terminal here uh, and find the, the negative terminal can go on to about there. And you'll hear the quartz mechanism clicking after a second. Uh, no, you won't, because I think I've just connected it up wrong. No, I've connected it onto the same reel, that's why. Oops. Radio. Uh, if I connect it to there, that's going to be much better. One moment. I connect them both onto the same track. Oh, there it goes. Here, clicking. That quiet quartz movement. The difference here is that it's not, not instead of just the blob that you find in the standard quartz movements. This is actually a dedicated chip and it's called a Eurocell 1466HO. Let's take a look at the circuit diagram because I scribbled it down. Now, this is where if I turn, it would be nice if it was taking a charge, but it, the nickel cadmium cell just is not taking a charge at all. So that will gradually peter out over time. So here's this schematic and I'm just going to focus down that. And it uses, because it's super low current, it just uses these two resistors and this diode here to create the power supply. So it's two 27K resistors and fundamentally diode resistor and a resistor in this leg just to split the load. And uh, that also provides protection. If anything were to short against the circuit board, it wouldn't really be catastrophic because there'd be a limiting resistor in either leg of it. But that goes straight to the nickel cadmium cell and then the circuitry is across that. And it's quite interesting because this chip is based, it's got a 32.768 kilohertz crystal and there's a really high value resistor across it. I couldn't measure the value of the resistor and reading the color codes doesn't really help because it's got six bands in it. I don't know if it's because it's quite a specialist resistor, but I, my guess is two mega ohm because it's uh, red, brown, green, black, black, brown. Um, unless, uh, have I read that the wrong way around? Oh, that could be huge if it was the other way around. Oh, not sure. I'm not sure what value that is. It's unusual to see a six uh, band color code, but it, it's it's across the crystal. It's going to be super high value. But it's also got this tiny little tunable, this little trimmer res uh, capacitor, I think it is, from the positive rail down to one leg of that to just allow fine tuning. 
and there are reference points. The, this thing is covered in test contact points, a uh, big cluster of them at that side in particular. And it means if they put it in a jig, they could probably tune that so it's exact timing. The output to the coil, it, it's quite interesting the way it does it. Because it's just binary division and uh, logic, it's got the two outputs. Let's call them A and B. And they basically, they're normally low, but they actually go a wee pulse high like that. And the A one is out, out of phase with that. 50 degrees out of phase, uh, 180 degrees out of phase, technically speaking, if I'm going to say it properly. And uh, what actually happens here is that normally both of the lines are negative, but as each one goes uh, positive in its turn, it means that effectively, say for instance, if this one was negative and that was uh, then went, went positive, it means that the coil would pulse in that direction. But then when this one is back to negative and then this one goes positive, it pulses in the opposite direction. To limit the current going through the coil, they've got a non-polarized electrolytic capacitor. It's quite rare to see, uh, other than in audio applications, it's quite unusual to see a non-polarized electrolytic. But it's a 220 microfarad capacitor in series that lets a small pulse of current on th through on each half, uh, on each cycle. And that, uh, these coils, they basically, the magnetic field is offset slightly to the magnet that rotates in there, so that as it rotates, it kind of, it gets over inertia and then clicks into the other position, so that means uh, it basically flips 180 degrees each time it gets a pulse. They're quite neat. It's worth stripping apart a cheap clock movement and just looking at the mechanism inside it running. Sometimes it happens so quickly that you have to get a sharpie and just put, if you look at the little round cog in it, just put a mark on one side and you'll see it alternates between each side. So, um, that's very neat. Uh, that just leaves one thing. It says, do not loosen nut. And that is a challenge. So let's loosen the nut. Let's try and focus a wee bit higher to see this, in fact. Is that going to... Uh, I think that's going to focus on that. Yeah, it's good enough. So let's get the white background out of the way so we don't swarm things out. Let's take a small chug since it's the weekend of whiskey and cream soda. Mmm, nice. Mm. Alcohol pops for adults. So I'm going to undo this and this... I'd did this one as an apprentice and really mess something up because everything just fell apart. As could happen here. So let's pull that out. This is a terrible idea. This is never going to go back together again. This couples on to... Oh, that's quite complicated. Yeah, I'm suddenly regretting it already. Oh, this is never going to go back together again. Oh, well. So here's the first... Uh, this is a lot more complex than I was expecting. Blimey. That is weird. That is so complex in there. So we get this uh, thing. Very stylish in its own right, almost steampunky. We get this here. We've got the main cam mechanism, which is two brass plates, slightly differently sized. And then another arrangement underneath. Uh, so these pins here are basically riding on the cams. And then they're actually acting as a rack and pinion to actually change that position. That is really complex. I did not think it was going to be like that. Now I can see, uh, this is something, as I say, when I was young, I took one to bits and it just fell to pieces. You know, it had just been delivered to the job and I wanted to see how it worked. It was a really bad idea. So what I did was uh, the old clock it was replacing was one with the non-solar dial on it. So um, I just thought, oh, at least I get to keep the use the quartz mechanism. I just stuck the old dial on. So the lighting may have been on site longer than desired in that particular job. It was a supermarket. It was a safe way, actually, uh, with really shit management. So screw them. Anyway, yeah, that's quite interesting. I didn't think it was going to be anywhere near as complicated as that. And there's a wee set of worm drive mechanism, the screw, the yeah, worm wheel that winds that round. That is complicated. So, um, yeah, the Singamo. 
time switched. I mean, they're so widely used and super reliable apart from the, the, in this case, you know, this would be an easy fix. I could literally just pop one of these new nickel metal hydride cells into that and that would be completely working again. I should do that, shouldn't I? Uh, I've, I've said it, now I should do it, shouldn't I? One moment, please. And that's it fixed, and that includes the reassembly of the solar dial. Makes mental note, uh, I'm sure it made a mental note last time, never ever take a solar dial apart again. Oh, they're complex to put together. The little uh, rack and pinny arrangement, it, they, you kind of have to put little timing marks and then clamp them in position with your finger while you try and jiggle the other next component in. It's very much, it's like a game of mechanical Jenga. It's just like, as soon as you slip up, it all just drops out of sync again. But once it's back together, it seems fine. So here's the new battery, and because it only had two terminals, uh, whereas the other one had a three at two at that side, I put a bridging wire across and drilled a small hole. Um, other things worthy of note. Uh, this pin uh, comes out. All these pins just unscrew. And if you unscrew this pin, it gives access to the contact you can actually lift the contact out and it exposes the other one for cleaning as well. Um, and uh, you can see some modest pitting has occurred in this. It's been obviously picking up modest load, but you know, the contacts are absolutely massive. So I could see this giving plenty of service life still if it was to get reused. Um, other things worthy of note. Yes, one of the nice things about the old mechanical timers versus the electronic ones, a lot of the electronic ones, are not very good at handling inductive loads. Either the load they're switching on uh, or a contactor, uh, if they're just driving it via contactor. And what often happens is that, you know, it might be displaying the time and then the load comes in, it goes jink. And uh, then it just drops out. It just resets completely. And you turn up to the job and uh, the time the time is just a random value. You think, oh, blame is that like losing its, uh, was it a power failure? Was it, did it not have the battery back up? And you set the time again. And next thing you know, uh, a week or so later, you're back. And these things, it tends to be progressive uh, in, over time with if they're switching a high inductive load, that it will just get worse and worse and worse. Whereas these things just keep battery on. There's nothing to really upset them. The only thing that has failed in this one is the, uh, nickel cadmium backup battery and that was it and the whole thing is mechanically sound because it is so robustly built so um good to see one of these again it's a long time since i've seen one really robust time switches they're very good